Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Growers Workshop, episode number 12. And tonight we will be discussing the flowering cycle, the generative growth phase for those photoperiod plants. Welcome, everyone. Welcome back. Vader, Shrimp, how are you both doing this week? Good, good. Yeah? Doing well, thank you. Doing well. All right. I love the enthusiasm from the team. Everyone's uh, just as hyped <laughs> up as I am. It's America's Dino. birthday this weekend. Yeah, we got Canada so Day this weekend. It's party time. So busy prepping for all the activities and stuff. I'm a little like, all right, switching gears. We're yeah, no, I know. Back on I this, know. right? You know, away from family and stuff a little bit. But I'm right. here. Engaged. Well, we, we appreciate everyone who's joining us live tonight. We know a lot of people are out having fun this weekend on vacation. Traveling. Uh, ma- traveling, all that. Be safe out there. Have fun celebrating uh, the country's birthday. But uh, we'll be here uh, chopping it up. Uh, and I want to give an extra special thanks to the uh, supporters, all the members, the the artisans, the journeymen, the apprentices. I see all those little seedlings scrolling up through the, uh, the chat there. Thank you for all of your support uh, for the channel. And we have our first... Uh, members only uh live stream coming up pretty soon i believe we decided we're going to start a fungi discussion over there a little more heady of a topic yeah Uh, so that'll be fun that'll be fun conversation there so but tonight you know we've kind of let up uh you know shrimp you laid out the roadmap for these next couple shows uh we've done a lot about vegetative training we kind of did two stages of that uh, Vader and I went into some grow chamber stuff and we're going to circle back around and do a final part three of the grow chamber. Uh, and actually, hopefully when we do that episode, Vader might actually be here live. We'll be able to do the build out that weekend potentially. So we'll see. I but, will. uh, now leading up to it though, we, we made it through veg. It's time to flip the flower. Uh, I mean, I just threw some plants outdoors. I'm ready to kick off this season in the greenhouse and a little bit outdoor. And, um, yeah, so tonight let's talk about flipping these plants over these photo period plants so getting them into flower what does that what does that even mean though photo period plant what the what the heck is a, what are we talking about silence dead silence photo period oh, i thought plants. you were going to continue I thought no i was asking I a question was i was going. asking a question no and then i kind of half expected shrimp to jump <laughs> in well i was going to mute my mic because my neighbor's gardening um outside but it is the growers workshop so i can't really get mad at him for the gardening noises but there's potentially a blower in the background right now so i apologize to everyone listening photo period plants do any anyone of you want to field this one what is a photo period plant for people who don't know i wasn't prepared for this well you wrote the show notes I so right before the stream <laughs> strip turns to me it says i'm just gonna let you talk vader <laughs> And I was like, no, I was planning on letting you talk because you wrote out a nice little list about what us to follow. So I think this is us battling each other about who will talk first. We'll carry this one. (laughs) Well, well, Um, let's talk about what we're not talking about. (laughs) We're not talking about autoflowers, right? So an autoflower is a plant that no matter the light you give it, no matter how many hours of light, even if you're giving it 18 hours of light, six hours of darkness, that's going to automatically grow out, move through its vegetative stage, and then move into flowering all on its own without you having to do anything. Just plant it, give it light, and go. Whereas photoperiod style plants, um, you know, we can keep them in between their stages and we can sort of control these hormones based on the light cycles that we provide for these plants in an indoor environment. Even outdoor, if you're doing light dip in a greenhouse or things like that. So, um, you know, we tend to go 18.6 to keep them in vegetative stage. But this is where I think a lot of people are asking me questions because I threw plants out into the greenhouse early this year when the light cycle was getting longer and I was moving in the flower, right? But this is where normally our photoperiod plants, they don't move into this flowering cycle stage until the light cycle decreases down below a certain threshold. And once that light decreases, the plant moves into its next stage of light, uh, life. This is my very rudimentary understanding. Yeah, so I'm, I'm hoping one of you can now keep correct it my, my no, uh, keep it all, keep it going. You got this. <laughs> I'm listening. <laughs> all right. That's well, all I got. <laughs> that's all I got. <laughs> let's yeah. Let's back out. So we've it all out. Let's back up. Um, talking about what is known in more horticultural nomenclature as generative growth colloquially referred to as the flowering cycle as the thumbnail would indicate and so we've gone through discussions about the plant being in 
germination or propagation stages. So establishing roots, beginning leaf growth, and surviving vegetative growth. Maybe some training, some manipulation through that. See previous episodes. Um, and then uh, talking about, so we didn't really focus too much on it, but the establishment of like a good rhizosphere or a strong, healthy root system. Um, so we, we did touch on it from time to time. Um, but okay, so now what? We've, we're ready. The you know, plants are ready to go. We've invested in them in a manner of speaking. And we're going to be doing something that is beginning to be referred to more so in, I think, the agricultural and commercial markets is a term I think that is coming back from agriculture, but is known as crop steering. Um, simple terms, right? Like manipulating the environment or the plant growth environment to force a hormonal change or a shift in hormone distribution through the plant to have a desired response and specifically vegetative or generative flowering. Um, and the simplest way to do that, like you said, Doggo, is, is like photo period or light cycle manipulation. And indoors, we can just change the timer and adjust the cycles keep it simple right and uh you can encourage your plants to begin to bud or show show gender parts um you know we're we're trying to encourage that that physiological change if it hasn't happened or expressed itself at some extent already um and and greenhouse you know there's you can you can manipulate light cycles in greenhouses with like supplemental lighting um or do some sort of light deprivation system and like you said if you're outdoor right now well, I mean you just kind of got to wait for it right wait you're waiting for things to flip yeah over. well that exactly so, so like I just recently put some out in the greenhouse two three days ago you know we're at about 14 and a half hours of light right now so they went from 18 directly to 14 and a half and they're doing fantastic threw some shade cloth over the greenhouse so I got a 40 percent shade Ooh, cloth hey, over it nice. so uh I didn't really even have to uh, transition them. I threw them directly out there, and they're just praying. You know, even to, 24 hours later, they're up praying towards the light. So the shade cloth, uh, thanks to uh, Dylan in chat, one of our mods, uh, uh, gave me some tips there. And uh, Vader backed it up, and so threw some 40% shade cloth up there. And uh, doing awesome. Uh, and, yeah, now it's just a waiting game. I'm going to continue to feed them, you know, the veg nutrients as they transition over. And then once I start to see some buds, boom flower nutrients here we go right and just uh off we go in the flower cycle so but what what is that threshold of timing though is it 14 hours is it 15 hours 16 hours uh, like what what typically will throw the plants over into flower it depends yeah mm -hmm. and that's where like if you if you jump outside you, many different kinds of plants right we're talking about lots of different species they're pretty much all going to flower um, depending on your kind of equatorial zone, but um, a majority of things will just begin to flower after a vegetative state for a bit, regardless, just because of the light cycles of the planet and the way they are. You can manipulate that by giving them external light, like in a greenhouse or even outside, running some string lights just enough, right? Just over them. Yeah. Um, then you can extend those flower or those vegetative periods longer than the generative growth period um, and it'll start to flip over there. So when we speak about doing like really controlled environments, um, getting to greenhouses or indoor where you just, and especially like indoor where there's no even residual light outside coming in from outside. A greenhouse can have residual light coming. Uh, you live in the city, street lamps, things like that nearby, your own home, weird random lighting coming off the your neighbor's the walkway. bathroom spotlight just comes out the window exactly right to hit your greenhouse all night long when they leave it on yeah you don't even notice angles. it when you build it right it all seems fine you're out there during the night but then like you're wondering why your plants are weird you walk into your greenhouse and uh one night you realize oh there's a bathroom I, i've been in my neighbor's house that's their bathroom light and it's shining on my greenhouse so you'll find things like that but getting into just a strict environment where you have complete control blackout control then getting into those um so even on a specific plant take our favorite plant hemp and you know where does that fall what is the best light cycles to move into that uh phase 
and that does depend different things have been bred and especially naturally things were different which is why i think when you get into older school plants heirloom kind of uh strains for things that it will be closer to how they had evolved and been or even in selective breeding through you know human influence and selection that we were picking things that were still revolved around in the environment with the sun and the nighttime and the moon and everything else as we grab things and then we get into a strict environment of control then the breeding um, selective breeding itself took place at which then when we were picking phenotypes those parameters weren't as much so older um, more heirlooms uh, varieties they can lend themselves to needing a longer day period shorter um, night period right so you could say 14 hours of light 15 hours of light a shorter nighttime period it will take longer to get through that generative phase through flowering um, to finish out instead of two months three months just as a random example um, and so in that phase, you're going to get the best flower growth and the best finishing product or the best fruiting product, whatever that is, with that light cycle. So it will be dependent on the heirloom variety itself. A lot of things we've gone down, especially like in our world, where we've gotten it to, yeah, like that 1212 was the standard for so long that the selective breeding took place. And then most hybrids you will find react the best in a 12-12 environment to get out the best flowers while finishing up the quickest. And then we get into small things like, yeah, and even certain varieties that were chosen because they were brought from something that was a much more northern hemisphere or, right, instead of it just being equatorial or southern, you know, down, but somewhere towards the poles where the light was different. Some of those genetics were able to lend themselves into the breeding when selective breeding was done in an extreme control environment so that yes even 11 hours of light and 13 hours of darkness will save you some power you'll get the same um output if not even a little bit quicker finishing time but we're talking yeah. days you know I you're lucky if it's say, three or four even days runs 12 12 anymore it's all about that 11 13 now i've been running that for years oh and i have too for a long time and slowly gotten to it it cut the power down everything worked so <laughs> but a lot of strains and things that i have done selection for and even my own selection as someone who loves to participate in breeding of plants and uh the whole kit and caboodle of it whatever species it is this selection for myself is also an influence in the heirloom varieties that i particularly grow and then breed or run every year myself yeah and you touched on something that i think makes all all the difference when you're looking at you know the minutiae between a few hours here and there and that's the source or the region of which the varietal or heirloom type came from because um, that also is going to influence things like the kind of substrate makeup in their kind of native homeland if you will um, but in general when we get into this time of year in nature or when we have successful crops of this type indoors or in controlled growing environments, what we're generally seeing is a higher sort of nutrient value or a shift towards a increase in specific types of macronutrients that allow the plant or the plant is consuming more of these types of nutrients specifically like a phosphorus type of thing um and so, you know a bunch of the micronutrients as well along with yeah. that shifting um, away from that nitrogen consuming more phosphorus and potassium um you know right yeah yeah no exactly thanks yeah, for right. bailing me out on that one no it's um, okay i knew i started talking and i was <laughs> muted sorry yeah no right but that's the, the nutrient change and this is why we have the you know f typically flowering recipes versus veg recipes if you're um you know uh using the the liquid nutrients i know the uh, the no-till uh organic living soil folks out there probably cringe when they hear us <laughs> talk about dumping nutrients into the salt. soil but yeah it's salt it's salt but uh, you know for a lot of beginning gardeners uh, you know regardless of whether you're growing a medical crop or even vegetables that's how they're going to start they're you know they're going to grab uh, some plants from their local big box store or their nursery put them in their gardens uh, and they're going to 
oh, I can hook this onto my hose and just water them and feed them or, uh, you know, and, and that's is where sometimes you can do more damage, uh, you, you know, than good by not knowing what nutrients to feed when. So what, which is why it's always good to know what stage your plant is in. So you're giving it the right things it needs. Um, if you're in flowering and you're pumping a lot of nitrogen, that's not going to do you as good as opposed to if you shift, you know, you're going to want to shift more towards that, uh, you know, phosphorus, the potassium. Um, carbohydrates in there, right, to help bulk up the, uh, get that generative growth that we're really going for to have a, a nice yield and at the that end. That can help with the signal of moving them over. So the nutrients themselves also play a part, not just the light, but also adding in those different ratios will get them to move over into their fruiting stages. Now that's what's going on is that nitrogen, that's green growth, right? All the leaves, no matter what species it is, like that's all your generative stalks, your leaves, things like that are going to help a lot with nitrogen. They still need nitrogen for fruiting. They still need that product, but then they're going to start craving that potassium and that phosphorus. So as they start to fruit, as they start to set for their own breeding moving forward, and then you're going to be able to bump that up. Now it gets different with different kinds of flowers. If you're involving pollinators, things like that versus um, wind pollination or something where they don't need they're not trying to attract pollinators in that early stage so that could be slightly different per species so that's something that's always good to know just like about how um we were p you're pointing out shrimp that like oh it's good to know the history of the genetics of any species and any heirloom of where it comes from because even a tomato that came from a much northern scandinavian hemisphere that was bred up there in a certain it could be the soil uh, environments it could be the lighting environments they're going to react differently. And so it's good to know your history going into something. And so same with different species of plants, knowing, you know, where, what it's going to fruit and what it's going to have going into the system. Is it going to need pollinators? It's going to spend an extra few weeks trying to attract pollinators during that time. And you'll be a little bit slower to get into your nutrient needs for pota extra potassium phosphorus being able to have that availability or if not. Yeah. And, you know, I think you'd, bringing up something important that's kind of timely right now is regional influences on environment and for example much of the west right now is in a critical drought and water is of the utmost importance and use strategies are something that even corporations are beginning to employ for the sake of tax breaks um, but when it comes to uh, that's another topic I guess in general mm. but <laughs> when another it comes show. to show yeah, time. a different podcast. Um, <laughs> uh, Check it out on the other channel. Yeah, yeah. no, that's, but when a, it that's comes a great to like topic. A, we could talk about that with Rob on from the stash. That's a great topic to get into it over there. Yeah, <laughs> when it when it comes to uh, water management or nursery water management, storm water management, those kinds of things, um, recycling water is a big part of that process, and so making sure that water is not in a sense toxics when it gets returned into the system as part of that system or that that whole network of uh, recovery drains and there's like you know biofiltration involved in some cases to make a complete system for that but um, really what that's doing is ensuring a clean water source and a water source that plants can then use whether it be through um, <clears throat> kind of a faster method of chemical input or a slower method of biological mitigation um, you get to the same a similar um, you know end point where you have a cleaner water source that you can reuse into your system um, and you know there's different theories on that and I kind of touched on both the two very polar opposite ones um, so uh, that's kind of an interesting way to deliver that information if you ask me uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> self critique in real time um, but we're you know at this time Vader we've talked about this a lot in some of our other practice but it's about like how we were adjusting uh, carbohydrate levels and sh you know sugar levels mm -hmm. at the time of uh, this flowering or generative stage and how have you found success in, in keeping whether it's a uh, you know constant kind of feed level of uh, carb sugars or is it something that you ramp up or ramp down or change throughout the let's call it a eight week ten week cycle 
You know, ultimately it's going to depend on, of course, the de one delivery method and two what, you know, and as part of that delivery method, I guess it's not even two, it's, it is delivery method. And some of that is going to be like the system itself, right? Hydroponics, uh, what variants of hydroponics you're in there. You know, you get into something like cocoa where you've got a little bit more, it's not just straight inert media. Um, Versus like getting into an actual like yeah, living soil uh, permaculture or if you're getting into soil where you're tilling or even dumping and doing fresh reruns right with soil um, but in doing pot growing so that delivery method changes and then also the delivery method of the particular nutrients themselves and different brands or companies that make uh, mineralized nutrient mixes um, whether they're going for powdered and you mix it up yourself or whether or not they're liquid stasis and they're you're holding it that way they are going to deliver in different ways and then so uh, that becomes a complicated question right about I, I thought it was an easy one i thought that was like a softball uh, kind of no that that right then there. becomes very specific and that's why <laughs> when going into say I, i'm brought in somewhere and i'm going to consult on something then i myself all the time i'm going to be like okay thank you for telling me that i can't even tell you right off in my head give me a couple of days to go research mm. find the proper research and then um, make a plan accordingly for that particular those plants those species those heirlooms whatever they are along those routes but that stuff is far more variant and there's a much more gray area involved a lot of stuff it's not just straight you know this is hydroponics and this is synthetic nutrients and this is living soil and that's just the way it is because even environments and soil and the environmental factors around really affect those things so when it comes to uh, adjusting say and something most of the time in hydroponics and availability and same even with um, soils is that I mean, it does get a little complicated in layering for soils because during the year, right, in springtime, it's acting, it's going a certain way. Then you have much more foliage drop during the fall. Um, once you have all those leaves and branches fall, then you're going to get a lot more fungi coming. You got winter go, but that will depend on what equ equatorial environment you're at mm -hmm. and the kind of woods and shrubs and other stuff going. Like when you get into permaculture, it gets super complicated. <laughs> There's no like one right answer for that, especially. I just pictured the uh, Vader in the lab montage with a series of mini cuts, <laughs> like taking clones and leaf cuttings and like spinning it in the tube. Well, I was I was heady. <laughs> well, I'm curious though. Well, sorry, I don't, are you gonna go ahead and finish? My, I was gonna my take little, it a different direction. My just just to wrap up that one thing is like, especially when it comes to like hydroponics, because I use that a lot and I show it right, very yeah. simple. Like we'd love to front drain, and it's a really simple, easy way for people to just like here. Here's a great example, without getting crazy and worrying about it. And so that's why with something like the flood drain system, um, running a particular nutrient company that has very stable nutrients, right? And the Dutch are really good with this, which is why Ooh. I'm always leaning people into like Dutch about? brands, regardless. Um, just because they've been doing it for so long and they put a lot of time and effort into it because of their environment themselves, right? They have all the canals, they had all these issues. It was, it was, they needed to figure something out in a way that in other places, they just kind of let it go. And so in that research and in their development, they were able to make systems at which have a very low impact, environmental impact on the way out, as far as like how much salt, and we get into like salts and sodium and how that affects microbes and microbial growth and blooms and stuff like that for different kinds of algae and things, Runoff which and start stuff. eating away at nutrients and then just creating pH issues and it gets crazy. Parasitic. So in hydroponics though, they develop systems that are very stable, which means that you can run nutrients pretty much the same exact PPMs, EC, which is your TDS, your total dissolved solids, you can see those in your levels in your measurements by just running it straight from all the way seedling all the way to the end of flower and you could just run them basically the same and you're going to get great results. Now you start adding in those extra factors in there. You start dialing it in with like, you know, certain products like Canna's for a great example where they have the PK1314 product, um, you know, advanced nutrients, all of them, they all have their little things that they'll throw in there during those times and it gives yeah. you that little bit extra bump bloom boosters yeah the, bloom boosters but a lot yeah. of those really if you run without them and which is <coughs> especially for beginners don't even worry about adding in all those additives just get a solid npk program going run through your vegetative and your generative phase your flowering slash fruiting phrases and then start adding in things lightly 
to get up to those maximum yields, the, ma the right, the the best outcome that you're looking for. Yeah, you but can just running things really stable in. is always my advice and the best way to go about it, which is why I don't like, oh, here, let's do all this crazy stuff. That becomes very specific at that point. Right. Well, now, I, I was going to ask, you're talking about, speaking of putting these additives in, <clears throat> circling back to the carbohydrates for a second, do the types of carbohydrates matter? Uh, you know, I mean, I can go into a hydro shop and I'll see, here's berry flavored carbs here's citrus flavored here's you know lemon flavored here's watermelon here's grape is that are those types of carbohydrates really going to have any effect on the actual taste and flavor of the the outcome of the flour or is that all is that where we get into marketing hype around some of it uh, is true because what it's doing is it's promoting and this doesn't just go for something like hemp for example that's like really popular with all that mm -hmm. stuff and a lot of brands are obviously you go into a hydro shop, they're, they're developing products uh, based around this particular crop because it's one of the biggest sellers for, for them, even though it's kind of been underground for a lot of stuff for a long time around the world. They still knew that it was, still was their sales, right? So they've been, they're not just doing it for the marketing. They are going through it and finding ways that will promote flavonoids to right like lemonine or things what like that about right? just mm -hmm. straight molasses though like, i was gonna say don't do the no to be they just honey, do they dump molasses in honey like is that a cup of sugar do you have to dissolve it in some water okay, so yeah, now that? we're getting into kind of different yeah different kinds of carbohydrates and then uh, the effect on the microbiome itself because even in hydroponics you've still got bacteria and archaea and things like that in the mediums. You get something like cocoa going and you'll even get, and I'm sure cocoa growers out there have seen like, oh, I'm getting fruiting bodies from mushrooms popping yes. up out, out of my, my medium, out of my cocoa. That's yeah, because the fungi out. and mycelium are still in there. Even if you don't add in the little packet, it's, it comes with the plants, right? Like it's fungi is cruising around all through the air and so with bacteria mm -hmm. and all those things. And that's why environments make a big difference um, where you're like, and where you're located yeah. because that, that will slightly change. But those, those things are straight across the board. What about things like, I see some people are mentioning PGRs here in the chat. I mean, that brings me back to like the first time I was like, wow, this, this super thrive. The plants really love this stuff. This vitamin B, this is uh, amazing stuff here. It's like, Oh wait, wait what's yeah, a PGR? Plant, gro <laughs> plant growth regulators are it, there. There's the good, the bad and the ugly for yeah. sure. And not everything is the same. It's the same way that people love to like throw. It sounds really scary um, for someone to say like, oh, there's heavy metals in that. There's more heavy metal and um, heavy metals in living soil concepts and soil than there is in like a hydroponic system. So w what is that? How do we can come to a conclusion with that? But that becomes an extremely difficult or not difficult, um, but it's, it's a really deep concept to get into. And we'd have to start right at 101 just to talk about what minerals are, uh, metals, gotta go to like unit compounds, conversions. organic chemistry, Gosh, and then how bacteria, that. plants, um, they metabolize, and then the balance of that system. And even for myself, oh it's very overwhelming. Yeah, no, this, we need to call in the experts for this one. So, um, yeah, most PGRs and hormones, things like that, definitely if you're not familiar with it, stay away from that don't 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 get sold into those kinds of things it's probably not something um you have to worry about too much and the benefit over it you could get yourself into a place although i will say that most shops in most places now it's much better than 20 years ago shrimp you were there um, just a cap full the kind of That's stuff you, you used need. to be able to grab at a hydroponic shop like when it gets into like you know pesticides and you know those kinds of like really nasty chemicals where, you know, mm -hmm. there were brands like, you know, Avid floating around. Oh, yeah, go throw that on there. Yeah. Um, that have no. these incredible half-lifes that will just, like, even though you're getting into flowering and you did it during veg, it's still floating around inside of the plant. Oh, that's creepy. I remember but picking nowadays, up orders. nowadays, it's tough to pick up that stuff. Most hydro shops and everything, like, the states, all this, are regulating it a lot more. Yeah. So you'll find that to be an issue, regardless in agriculture. Now, how we go about actually applying that depending on the industry so whatever plants you're applying to because obviously a fruit that has a skin and things like that 
the application and the absorption is going to be different than in a flower. And then especially in in the way you use something. Um, So whether you're eating it or you're making it into tinctures or you're fermenting it with alcohol, right? To Mm -hmm. make wines and things like that. That's where like, oh, even doing like fermentation is going to change the chemical structure and and compounds that are within those fruits. Yeah, you touched on a great point here. Um, But I do think that most hydro shops nowadays are pretty safe for most of the products that you get into. And you shouldn't be too worried about it. Oh, I don't know. It depends on the how long the employee might have, you know, how long he, they've been there. That that can be true. It depends on, on the products and what they're doing. So that's why research for the particular kind of plant that you're running, whether or not that goes with those plants and the delivery method, not just the delivery method of the nutrients or the plants themselves, but also the delivery method, meaning into your ingestion of your body, right. how that's going to end up being consumed and whether yeah. or not those compounds are going to be transferred in that way. It's like, wait till you get recommended the organic mosquito dunks. It's like, what? (laughs) It's not a thing. (laughs) Organic mosquito dunk? Interesting. Well, what what are some of the, you know, I'm kind of looking through our show notes here. For someone uh, who's trying to, you know, maximize their, their genitive growth phase, right? They want the biggest yield possible. When we think about the environmental aspects, indoor, myself in a greenhouse, what are some targets that we're trying to shoot for in terms of environment? We know we're going for that 12-12, right, 11-13 kind of light cycle. What temps should we be looking at? Humidity, I mean, is temperature and humidity going to have uh, an effect on, on flower? You know, I've, 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 I've found in my experience kind of the hotter the flower, uh, or hotter it is during that flower cycle, the tendency the plants would have to stretch more, especially even if it's warm in the night cycle. Um, yeah, I think there's a threshold. Example, yeah. There's a yeah. threshold to that. Yeah, and the, the shift in day to night temperature is definitely one of them. Another one, though, that I think has something to do more so with lighting than temperature may influence temperature a tiny bit, but is the type of light. Uh, the spectrum specifically that you might want to employ in yeah. the generative flowering stages. Not all spectrums are created equal. <laughs> <laughs> Did you tra- trademark that one? Did somebody get that one? Yeah, no, keep no, that. we got it right here. Public all domain. Right, we just did right. it right there. Boom. <laughs> Look for our no. LED but no, but That's a great point, right? I mean, um, perfect example. Not only is it uh, we want to shift in photo, light, photo period, you know, at the time of, of daylight hours, but also the spectrum of color that vegetative stage more of that blue spectrum now we want to move over into that red spectrum for uh, for the flower stage bring on that bulk a sh- yeah a shift towards that for sure and it could be gradual could be a little bit more controlled or yeah well and know. we have uh you know i don't want to dive deep in, into spectrums now in fact so what I i'll do is no, yeah, well, I'll put keep a it on flowering. I was keep it on flowering, but back there for a second. That's why yeah. I, was, I was trying to get away from it. I'd love to talk about. It. I saw a couple of comments in the section and people talking about things, and it's like, yes, you know, I, I could really dive a little deeper. But yeah. well, I also want to let them know that path for this episode for for light spectrum. However, we did a phenomenal episode with Austin from Chilled LED. I believe it was episode oh, yeah. three. So I will go ahead and add a link to that back in the description for those coming back. And I'll throw it in the upper right-hand corner as well. So episode three of Grower's Workshop. Great episode with uh, Chilled LED. So uh, talking about tuning your spectrum and things like that. So check that episode out if you haven't seen it yet for kind of a real deep dive in the spectrum. So Okay, but yeah. temperature. Yeah. Humidity. Humidity. Even. One plus the other equals... Uh, either a healthy crop or powdery mildew. Ooh, right, and that's a fine, <laughs> fine um, system of definitions or outcomes, right there. Yeah. Um, you know, something that's commonly discussed is VPD or the vapor pressure deficit. Oh, now that's a whole episode on its own, right there. Okay. We should but have now, a chart ready for that one, real quick, just to flash that on the screen for posterity's well, so for, sake, at least. Yeah. Um, I, from I, <laughs> I, I do agree, though. I think We're mostly going light is going to be your number one effect. Okay, yeah. then nutrients, things like that, and then the environment would be like kind of coming in third, right? Humidity, temperature. Uh, that's not going to be okay. so much a factor about inducing flower or something. That's just going to give it different, almost 
structural growth rates and size um, for the fruits or just for the stalks, for the leaves, right? All of those different parts of the plant, the physiology itself. It's kind of like, you know, once you get that, once you get it, you've got to, you're growing in like a greenhouse, you're growing indoors, big rooms or whatever, and you kind of get it dialed, you can kind of feel it, right? Like when you walk into the room. I don't, I don't know. Um, I used to say that or claim that at least. <laughs> I don't no, know. <laughs> it, it, look, I, I learned, I can tell you right now, I learned my first run in the greenhouse, right? I, I saw how they behaved when I put them in. I saw what they changed differently. I saw how the ones behaved in the shade versus the ones in the sun. Changed some things around. Round two, put them in. They are, they're slamming right now. They're loving it. Okay. And you know what? I've been more hands off this time than it was the first time because the first time I was really worried about them now like you know because even after going through that right by that by the time I got to the eighth to ten week to eighth to tenth week of flower geez I can't talk um Weef. I had learned enough about how the greenhouse operates the temperatures and whatnot mm -hmm. what the plants want so now second round in repeating another flowering cycle in the greenhouse I'm already off to a much better start, having learned from what I did before. And you're absolutely right. After growing enough time and, and you can't, it's really hard to explain to growers who are new or like I have a friend of mine who's going through it right now. He's just going through a year. But already for me, from him walk, walking and seeing my grow for about a year and now him growing himself, even after having a failed grow before, he's already seeing what he has improved upon from his old grow the first time it grew a couple of years back. And he's already talked to me about changes we're going to make this weekend as we, you know, harvest and rebuild out. And we're going to build a shed out a little bit. So even him as a new grower, the more you grow, you start to realize, okay, I see what the plants need. I see what works for my style because everybody's style is going to be different. So I, I guess this is a long way of me trying to back you up, shrimp. That Yeah, absolutely. You walk into your garden <laughs> and you start to eventually over time you'll learn what your plants need, what works, what doesn't it's work, like, and you'll be able to hot in here. Like you'll it's be able to read your plants. In here. Yeah, yeah, Maybe exactly. It's a too like, dry in here. I mm -hmm. don't know. Yeah. Um, but I will say that some of those things, right, like the too hot, too humid, um, and especially if they're in pots, it's affecting their rooting zones. So let's say the sun's beating down on a black pot that's a little small for a plant. And that plant is supposed to be, you know, shrimp and I, uh, I was talking to shrimp about this earlier in the week about some of those concepts about uh, dioecious and monoecious plants. So cannabis is generally a dioecious plant uh, when it runs well. So what that means is that there's a male and a female. They have separate sexes in their plants. Some plants are monoecious, right? So they have both sex um, parts in the plant. So like even you'll look at some flowers and these flowers have the female parts and these little flowers right next to it are the male ones they have a little bit more bulbous or whatever their stamen their stoma like all those things are slightly different um and we could get into like that kind of taxonomy or um detailed physiology and in that sorry that's not taxonomy that's for botany um, biology different kinds of plants but anyways moving into that now and like you think things like hemp that have if you give it the stress so the sun's beaten down right on that pot then you're seeing those monoecious traits come together where they're doing mm -hmm. both mm -hmm. and then they're able to also self seed each other or seed out if there was one particular sex that was more dominant in that area they might even get pheromones from that and and regulate for that so environmental stresses can affect your flowering especially when it comes to sex if you're trying to get fruiting plants to get the best results the most fruit sometimes you'll still get those fruits you want but you'll get half the amount of harvest of those strawberries or those grapes or whatever because of those stress factors in the flowering cycle so i still think it's good to kind of note that yeah. these can oh, affect here's a perfect example uh, anyone who has fruit trees right uh, your apricot especially this year here in the bay area at least even my orange trees very early fruiting we had an early rain this year your trees fruit and you get lots of buds then here comes March or April, big old windstorm, and all those little baby buds you have, boom, right? And that's just a natural disaster. My orange tree, I was so excited. I mean, the video is even in our intro, right? Bees pollinating everywhere. I maybe have like 10 oranges left on the tree just from the wind blowing them all off. All the buds get broken off, birds, squirrels, all that stuff. So these are all natural stressors that reduce your yield. 
right? And so that, you, you want to, if you're growing indoors you or in a greenhouse in a controlled environment, you're doing just that, controlled. You want to create the most perfect environment possible, and that's how you're going to maximize that yield. So they don't run into those yeah. stressors. <clears throat> I was about mm -hmm. to consult the book about the wind, but the book doesn't cover the wind. It's a natural stressor oh for sure. God. The book only consults the frost. Yeah, I was going to say, like, well, you know, that's the whole. Normally, it's like uh, everyone's just concerned about the frost, the season, how quickly frost or something comes. No. But even wind, storms, environment, they can well, affect he, whether or not pollinators will be able to get to flowers in time. Well, here's a great example of how it, it helps too, right? The wind. This, why do you think we have fans in our, our grow rooms? It's not simply just for airflow and air circulation yeah we want circulation to prevent powdery mildew and so forth but when your your stalks and your stems and your leaves are waving back and forth that's your plants exercising that's how they get their workout that's how those stems get big thick and girthy so they can transport all that water and and you know all that food throughout the plant to the buds and everything like that so you want just enough wind right with your oscillating fans to make them work out but you don't want too much wind where you're giving them wind damage and stressing them out right so again even with that it's finding that balance uh of airflow uh, you know it's perfect for your but, environment but same thing yeah if it's moving around and bending too much and they have to do too much work to um reset like scarring structures because basically they're kind of getting scarred as they go and if you think about it like a tree is a great example and this works for smaller plants as well and i, I know you can do it with hemp like it's a great point when you cut them open you're like well there's a big hole in the middle and that's because the xylem and the phloem they are cruising around the outer, excuse me, those outer edges of the stalks. So the outer edge, just like a tree, you know, you have the little circles. It's the outside of a tree, which is why when you build a tree house, they're like, hey, don't wrap ropes around the tree or cables around it. Put a single rod right through the tree and it will do the least amount of damage for the xylem and the phloem and all the flow that goes up and down the tree. Because it's that thin outer layer on the outside of a stalk and branching that's actually transporting all of your moisture, all of your nutrients, all of those things, that's the xylem and the phloem going up and down from your leaves all the way down to your root system. Through transpiration, which is where that VPD and everything comes in, where like the humidity itself is the transpiration because they use physics to move, like they don't have a heart like an animal, right? That's pumping the blood around. So they need the drier environment outside than the moisture environment inside of the plant's uh, vessel or veins to then pull the water out from their domata out of their leaves and then that's moving things through so even if it's really dry outside but you've been damaging the plants a lot and they're putting a lot of energy in there and you're in like that's like pinching plants and pulling them over so when we talk about flowering like oh doing in the middle of flower pulling them over it's going to stop that flow into those particular branch sites or those node sites those fruiting sites mm -hmm. so think about the physiology of how plants work when you're doing training and that will put it in perspective now maybe you want to maybe you want to bend that one top node and that fruit's not going to get as big but it's going to promote energy into the other fruits that you haven't stopped that to do yeah. and that Wait, could that, be a technique that is viable well i think i've run into that problem myself too here um w dealing with my cloner um i bought some you know i, I just recently I, i'm explaining to the the team here I've had some issues with this last round of clones I did. And I thought about this when I first bought, I went to the store, bought some new neoprene sleeves for my cloner. Uh, but, you know, normally the ones that come with the cloners have like little hole punched out that circle in the middle, and these ones didn't. And so I think all the ones, I think I'm basically suffocating my clones, the ones that aren't making it, and I'm getting, you know, dampening off. And uh, I think like they're getting choked, I think, because I don't have that kind of hole drilled out in the center. They're just getting pinched so hard the xylem and the phloem can't travel up and down and they're just dying in the cloner. When everything's clean, water temperatures, everything's perfect, you know, there's no bud rot, but they're just limping over. And I think great example I'm choking them out. I, I mean, I, this is just a guess, but after hearing that explanation, I, this this that. almost solidifies what my common sense was like. I think I'm choking them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> although it's hearing. not flowering, um, <laughs> very common with clones is that like, which is why with a lot of cloners, especially with things that have softer right branching or when you're taking smaller clones having these soft little plugs is going to make a big difference where those harder plugs are going to cut that part off and it's it, there is a fine line there especially with smaller things like on that outside part it is going to make a big difference definitely a recommendation where you get into something really woody 
then like you don't need the soft. You actually want something harder to kind of grasp onto. It's not going to choke it out or worry about it, and it's going to keep the structure going better. So that's why yeah. even using the same way you use different kinds of pots, using different kinds of plugs depending on the species of the plant, whether you're cloning what you're cloning, strawberries or tomatoes or whatever they are, think about the structural integrity of that particular plant. Yeah. Okay, so plant growth all the way through. All the way through. All the way through, we're into the flowering stages, and we've flipped it. We're going forth into the journey of the unknown sometimes. Um, sometimes we're just doing what we do commercially, um, you know, reproductively, perpetually, however it may be. Um, but for some more intensive research uh, or plant, plant uh, characteristic or genetic marker type of identification, uh, we might be employing a practice called uh, crop registration. And so this is a, a term that, again, similar to crop steering, has been with agriculture for some time, but is ultimately coming back into play as agronomy is becoming more of a prevalent factor in the field of agriculture once again. It's fantastic. Um, some of this information was pulled and translated from our good friends uh, at Trim, trim trim.io. They uh, provide some really fantastic commercial or industrial scale monitoring services, environmental monitoring and uh, metric compliance services. So if you're into that kind of thing and uh, you're struggling to keep your your processes in check and within uh, compliance, hit them up, Uh, Matt and crew, they're awesome. Um, But some of the things that their software helps keep track of and some things that we've kept track of in our plant trials have been uh, some responsive types of genetic traits, um, genotypic responses uh, relative to environments in some cases, uh, phenotypic responses uh, that are a little bit more common in other Mm -hmm. cases, but it's like plant height relative to spectrum or lighting. The, the root development relative to the ambient temperatures. You know, some plants are more suited for those harsher, higher um, root temperatures. You know, those might be like your more like desert type heirloom varietals, uh, you know, Eastern types in some cases. Um, we get a specific is looking at things like the stem diameter or the branching structure, the, the you know, inner node spacing, like if heat, like you brought up early, Doggo, like heat from night to day, if there's extreme temperature shifts, you might see an increase in some of that relative to a more stable environment where you're not seeing a, uh, a difference between night and day. Yeah. There's some Something going on out there. Yeah, I know. Dogs, everything. It's, 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 exciting podcast evening. is falling apart. There's all kinds of background noises yeah. now. But we yeah. got people gardening, dogs, well, motorcycles. Um, plants, bar, you know, as good. you go into these stages, might have different feeding, <laughs> feeding requirements. So you might see like an increase or a change in leaf colors or stem colors. Um, you know, it's a common one that people like to critique or, or notice, if you will. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I love how you're powering through that too. Just it's like, the, dog, for those who are just listening, you got to come watch the video because just the, <laughs> the, the facial expressions are priceless. <sighs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. I mean, registration. I mean, basically picking the keeper pheno, right? I mean, that's in layman's terms. This is right. Documenting. We've gone through flower. Which one are we going to keep? Which one are we going to breed with? Right. And 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 also. Not only breed with it, but documenting all of that so we know when we do go to breed with it, what are some of the potential outcomes and what can we use to our advantage in the next round of further breeding. Or now we've we've picked a winner, we've taken a bunch of clones of this keeper, uh, right? And now we're going to run a monocrop, right? And so, we're, again, we're going to refer back to this data. Or you're uh, always saving seeds and you want to go yeah. a few generations back. You went a couple generations down and you oh. backed yourself mm-hmm. into a weird corner mm-hmm. and everything's... Oh, pull pull back. Got to reset. Let's yeah. go back Nothing's to the start. Purple. Everything's yeah. green. Now you have green strawberries, and you're not sure why. <laughs> and they all taste bitter. You got to go a couple back. Yeah. So, yeah, now we're getting into breeding. Oh, oh, I, lots more. Okay, and that'll be the next show. Breeding will be the next show. We got harvesting coming up soon, and we got the grow room build out. 
final episode as well. So, so I think harvesting would probably be a better thing. Yeah, harvesting I think yeah. is next week. Yeah. That's yeah. what yeah. we got on the calendar. Harvesting yeah. and curing, something like yep. that. Yep, harvesting and curing, yep. Ooh. Flushing is a whole episode too. Ooh. I don't know Lots to talk that. about. I could, I could go talk. with harvest and flush, important. It's like a water episode. Yeah. All right, Water, hydroponics. Soil. Lots to talk about. Lots. That's why I love this kind of shorter form podcast. Uh, and I just want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, we're going to wrap it up right there. And uh, next week, we will be covering harvesting and curing next week. So check back next week, episode number 13. Thank you again, everyone, for the support. Please make sure to hit that thumbs up button if you can. Hit the share button as well. Let the algorithm know you're enjoying the show. Uh, everything has been free and clear so far. We're getting the, the green light from YouTube. So thank you for letting us keep the podcast moving forward. Thank you for all the support. Everyone showing up in chat, dropping comments, the thumbs up, all of that. Uh, all those interactions help. And we're up to, I checked last night, 82%. 82% of our watch time is from our subscribers. So that's awesome. So that means we still have a few of you left who are not subscribed. Hopefully today's the day uh, you will cultivate that uh, subscribe button. Uh, we sincerely appreciate it. And uh, until next time, have fun and be safe this weekend, everyone. No matter where you're partying, have a good time. Cheers, everybody. <laughs>